Hello and welcome to episode 31 of Charlotte Mecklenburg History with Dan Morrill. Today is Sunday, November 8th, 2020, and I am Dan's daughter, Mary Dana, here with Dan through Zoom after we've taken a break for a few weeks. We've had an exciting week. I love week. the break. I love the break. Right? It's good to be back, though. It's fun. It so, is. Glad, glad to be with everybody. Yeah, glad to, to be with everybody today and um, to get back in the swing of things. My dad said he's just going to do kind of a podcast where he just wings it, right? So he's just going to go through and show some stuff on his website. Well, I'm going to discuss, I think, what are some uh, interesting issues to me that could have profound impacts on uh, Charlotte neighborhoods. But uh, it might not be interesting to everybody, but I'm just going to do the best I can. Okay, hey, that's interest. okay. What do you always say? Uh, not paid, don't get right, paid a dime. Paid. And, uh, you know, so that's it. So you can do, how you, do it how you want. Absolutely. Okay. Okay, Dad, well, you can take it away. Well, you know, Mary Dana, I'm going to ask you some questions. They're not going to be opinion questions. Oh, no. Okay, good. Questions. My, I'm going to start out with an assumption. Something is going on with the city planning department right now that I could, I think could be enormously consequential for how the city of Charlotte grows and develops and evolves. And it's something called a unified development ordinance. Now, I would imagine that you are not, of course, you're a very intelligent person, but I would imagine you keep up with um, city affairs that acutely, I mean, you don't look at it all the time. I, I, I do I, not keep up with and I wouldn't be I wouldn't be surprised if I came to you and came to a lot of people who were uh, looking at this podcast and I said, well, what do you think about the UDO? And, you know, people would say, what do you mean? The under the door octopus or what? I mean, you know, they, they would have no idea what they, what it is. Like UFO. Well, it, it, it is a major move by the planning department to change the fundamental ordinances that uh, control development of the city. You know, I'm sure you've heard about zoning. Everybody, yes. first things they want to find out about a piece of property when they're thinking about buying it or developing it is what, what's the zoning? And if you know, there are all these zoning classifications and there are all kind of ordinances about trees, how you take care of trees. There are all, all kinds of ordinances about storm water. I mean, there are all kinds of ordinances, rules and regulations that you have to make in developing property. Well, the city is considering putting all of these ordinances into one ordinance. And this is going to go before the Charlotte City Council, as I understand it. It's going to go before a vote next year. And, we'll be, and if approved, will be put into place. So when they call about, when they talk about a unified development ordinance, they mean that they're taking all those ordinances and putting them into one. And the thing that is, and that sounds like a really good idea, you know, simplify things, make it more direct. And I'm not saying it's a bad idea. I'm not saying it's a good idea. I'm just saying it's what they're going to do, it's what they're going to propose. And they've gotten a lot of public input about it. It's been a very deliberate process. But the really important thing is what is this going to do for single family zoning? Because as you know, there are many, many parts of our city, the neighborhoods that we've been looking at, neighborhoods like Eastover, and you see some photographs of Eastover up there that we have looked at before. Neighborhoods like Myers Park, neighborhoods like Dilworth, neighborhoods like Plaza Midwood, 
neighborhoods all over the city that are zoned single family. Now that means that there are whole regions of the city that you can't put anything basically on the property except a single family residence. Now that it might, if you have enough land, you might have more than one single family residence, but you can't put up a duplex. You can't put it up a triplex. You can't put up uh, an apartment building. It basically has to be single family. Now there are certain areas like in Myers Park and even in Eastover where they've put up some multi-story stuff, but that's because it's on a major roadway or they've gotten a zoning variance or whatever, okay? Now, you think about what, what is motivating this idea about putting together this unified development ordinance. And I, I wanna just read really the top of this because I know I got an ad and I don't care about six meals, I eat too much anyway. <laughs> but you can read what it says here in the headlines, Charlotte leaders consider how to undo a legacy of housing segregation. Now, you know, there's this big thing in the city now. You hear a lot about the fact that we need affordable housing. We need, we need places where people who are uh, less affluent than others can live. And one of the contentions is that if you take a neighborhood like Eastover, and just for the heck of it, I'll try to go back as quickly as I can to Eastover. There it is. And people would say, well, even though Eastover started before zoning was put into place, because zoning is a 20th century invention. It didn't really come to Charlotte. It was either the late 1950s or the early 1960s that we got first got zoning. But they'll say, well, by saying that a neighborhood like Eastover can't have apartments or it can't have triplexes or duplexes, you're basically excluding the possibility of developing more living units per acre of land to allow more people to live there. And I'm not saying whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. That's not for me to say. I'm a preservationist. I'm not uh, a planner. But that is certainly one of the motivations that, that neighborhoods like Eastover, uh, you might, for example, be able to get a, uh, a drugstore in the middle of Eastover, or maybe you could get an apartment in the middle of Eastover, or, you know, it could be changed in terms of how the neighborhood is done. And to say the least, this is going to be an extremely, really major impact. Now, let's talk a little bit about Eastover. We've done a whole program on it before, mm -hmm. so we don't have to go into it in detail. But Eastover, as you remember, was laid out by a brilliant landscape planner by the name of Earl Sumner Draper, who was hired by Edward Cavill Griffith. Remember, we made a big deal about Cavill Road, not Coval Road. Right. He hired, he hired Earl Sumner Draper to lay out this absolutely magnificent neighborhood, which was done in the mid-1920s. And of course, there was no zoning at that time, no zoning whatsoever. But the whole idea of Eastover was to be a very elegant, palatial, grand neighborhood. And you remember that those of you who saw the earlier podcast, the man who was the developer, Edward Cavill Griffith, came from Northern Virginia. And therefore, by inclination, he was totally in favor of colonial revival style, style houses. That's what he was all in favor of. And that's his house, the one there on the right, which is still there, by the way. And you can see it. I know this pointer doesn't do worth scoopy on it. But, <laughs> you know, his house is right there. 
I don't know if I'm trying to move it around. Wiggy, wiggy, wiggy. That's his house. Right. And so, and it's very, very colonial. You can see all the columns kind of looks like gone with the wind. Not exactly, but a little bit. And you remember, this was the first house in Dilworth, the very earliest house, which is still on Cherokee Road. And Wait, you, you mean will, in Eastover? You said Dilworth. But... I meant Eastover, yeah, excuse me. First house in Eastover. I get mixed up. You know, I'm getting old. But anyway, that shows the kind of, of style, the kind of house, the kind of image that Edward Carville Griffith wanted for Eastover, okay? And you can see up here when he talks about sort of a representative example of a house that can be built up here on the left, you can see again, it's very colonial revival in style. Okay, so mm -hmm. that was the original neighborhood. Now, let's talk a little bit about what's happening to Eastover and then we'll talk about the UDO. This is a very interesting thing that's happened. There's no doubt that Eastover is going through a process of change. Now, the house up on the left, the brick house, you see the brick house on the left up here? Uh-huh. That was the house until really relatively recently that stood at the corner of uh, Cherokee Road and Cottage Place. I don't know if you remember that house, mm -hmm. Mary Dana. I have no idea. Well, because this is not an historic district, there's no design control over what basically happens in Eastover. And it's not really affected by zoning. Don't worry about the phone. It's going to go ringy ringy. <laughs> yeah, I heard uh, your phone ring. Don't 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 bother me. It's not the problem. No problem. We're all we're all we're all friends here. But you can see you would you would recognize that house more or less as colonial, couldn't you? When you recognize uh -huh. it. Uh-huh. Yes. I mean it's that now the house immediately to the right of it. You see this? That's the one under they, construction. That's they tore down this and they built it. Now there's no question that if Edward Cobble Griffith looked at that house, he probably would become nauseated. Now <laughs> I'm not speaking against the right of these people to build that house. They aren't breaking any laws. I'm sure they think it's beautiful. And I'm sure there's some people who watch this podcast who think that house is much more beautiful than the one beside it. So I'm not, I'm not trying to condemn anybody. But there's no question about the fact that when you change a neighborhood and you put a different style house up there, that totally changes the character of the neighborhood. Eastover is not the same anymore when you put that up there. And by the way, just for the record, and I can't tell you which one because I committed to the person that I would not publicize it. But there's another house just up the street on Cherokee, which is also very traditional in style, which is uh, under contract to sell and which will be according to the the person that I talked to will also be demolished and I don't know what will replace it. But Eastover is already going through a change in the neighborhood and these changes, and we talked about a little bit about this when we, when we had the Myers Park um, podcast, the last one of the nauseating four, I think, or three <laughs> that, that I had, that I had on Myers Park. But uh, it does it does change the nature of the neighborhood you think uh now i'm not ask i i won't ask you mary dana which one of these you think is more attractive uh, you always put me on the that. spot i'm no i'm just saying <laughs> do you agree with me that building the house like the one on the right is not in keeping with the original concept for the nature of houses in eastover Yes, I agree. Okay, good. Well, I, I, didn't, I didn't want to put you on the spot. 
Now, in addition to that, now this is more directly what we're dealing with, what we dealt with in Myers Park. This is on, uh, I think, yeah, this, this, this one's on Hempstead. This one's being built on Hempstead. Now, they're, they're the same house. This is just a, a, a more oh. distant mm -hmm. view, and this is a closer view, but they're the same house. Now, again, I'm not criticizing what people have a right to do. I'm sure this, you know, I used this term once before. By the way, you're going to have to tell me time because I could really go long winded on this. But, you know, I've used the term before of parachute architecture. Haven't I okay. used the term parachute I, architecture? Maybe, I don't remember, but you probably. Well, it's, like you, it's like whatever's built has no relationship to the context. It would like if you put. It's like it's just dropped you, in by it's parachute. Dropped in, right. That's right. It's dropped in by parachute. Because you okay. can see the scale of the house here. You can see the scale of the house here. And this is, you'll have to admit, it is taller. It, so it is. The nature, and therefore the rhythm of the, it's like your teeth. Uh, the nature of the rhythm of the street, streetscape is, 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 is change. So change can have a dramatic impact. Now, Here's one, this one. No, you know, I think that one is on. Uh, I think that, I don't know where they are. I think <laughs> this one, I think this one is on, I think it's on Cobble. It's not on Cobble, it's on Hempstead. It's on one of them. Okay. And you can see, holy moly, moly mackerel. Holy moly, moly, that's a big house. That's a big house. And that, I'm, I'm gonna just say the same thing now. I want you to look at the picture on the lower right. I hope you recognize it. That is Edward Cobble. Yes, I was just going to say, I, I think that's. Now, here's the deal. And, I, and I'm going to show you this later. Uh, you know, with this unified development ordinance, which is going to really, this, the Eastover will continue to be predominantly single family but it's gonna make it more possible to be something other than single family. Well, one of the things that is truly uh, distinctive about the EC Griffith house is the sweeping front lawn vista. You know, it mm -hmm. sits back up on the hill. It's very close, by the way, to the farmhouse that used to be the dairy farm that we talked about before. But it will become possible to put, you could put living units here in the front yard. Now, to some people, I'm not saying that would happen. I'm not saying it would occur, but I'm saying it's going to make it more possible for that to occur. And there are some people who are going to say that that is just an absolutely horrible thing to have happen. Now, here's my here's my position on the UDO. First of all, I think people ought to know what's coming. I think the idea is, Mary Diana, we want to make neighborhoods more walkable. We want to make them more diverse. We want be a, we want people to be able to walk to a neighborhood grocery store. We want, you know, where I live on Middleton Drive, 139 Middleton Drive, you know, I can walk to Zio's and I can walk, uh, you know, to a lot of different establishments. Mm -hmm. Well, they want more people to be able to do that. See, that's the idea. And also, they believe that a neighborhood is more, what's the word I would use, uh, appropriate. If it has a mix of incomes, a mix of ethnicity, a mix of, of, of different kinds of people. And, and they'll point, for example, to neighborhoods like um, Plaza Midwood, which mm -hmm. was developed before these zoning things were put into place. 
in which does have a greater mixture. So that's, that's, that's really what they're after. I'm not saying that that is necessarily a bad thing, but here's what I am saying. I don't know the degree, well, it's gonna, the implementation is everything. If, if things are done sensitively, I think it w could work. If things are not done insensitively, I think they can be somewhat uh, disturbing. And I wanted to show you, uh, the uh, I've shown this before, but I think it's, it's, it's worth showing again. I want you to simply uh, look at a, a house that we were very much involved in. This is a house that was, uh, this appeared in the newspaper on the 27th of May, 1928. I took the photograph literally off the, you know, the newspaper computer printout. So it's not the greatest quality in the world, but it does show you the house mm -hmm. built in 1928. And, you know, I've mentioned before that these, these houses are really important because they, they are in essence, a, an artifact. They have, they have a wonderful story about them. And one thing that preserved, here's the house. That's the house we saw being built before. One of the things that we do on all of our particular properties is there's that picture again, is uh, we do a very full history of these particular structures because the thing that really makes these build, by the way, how are we on time? Do you have any feel? I, you know, I forgot to set the timer at the beginning, but I think you've been talking about 20 minutes. Okay. The thing Does that, that really sound brings, right to you? Yeah, 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 whatever. <laughs> um, it's uh, it's uh, seven twelve. By the way, that's what time it is. But yeah. Anyway, what really makes these properties come alive is the stories. Going back to the Edward Cavill Griffith house, it was the fact that it was his house. He developed East Stoker. He had the vision. Well, the same is true. Now, let me you know you run into these fascinating stories. The family that first built this house in 1928, their name was Knowlton. And I came across and did research on Marie Wheeler Knowlton, who born 1893. Uh, she didn't die in 1900. That's a mistake. That's yeah, a, not I, when I she go, was seven. I, I got to I gotta, I gotta go back and change that. <laughs> I'm glad I looked at it. She died. Um, I, anyway, she, she, she's, she, she's 19 not here something. Longer, but 19 something. I'll go back and change it. But she was, you know, everybody thinks, well, women were really not, of course, she had a family. And, you know, this is her daughter. This is her son. He was, uh, had an interesting name, Nagus. Isn't that hmm. an interesting name? That is an interesting Graduated name. from Central High School, was in the U.S. Navy. This woman married a bishop of the Episcopal Church. They were big Episcopalians. But this woman had a rather dramatic impact. Gosh, I'm glad I saw that, got changed. Um, <laughs> she had a rather dramatic impact because do you believe it or not, the public library in Charlotte was closed down about 1938. It's mm -hmm. in the essay. I didn't go through and read it because the voters didn't approve a bond uh, for the library. They had to close the public library down. And she led the effort to get that library reopened so she was a she was a woman of substance but then a man by the name of victor shaw who was the mayor of charlotte yeah he and his wife elsie babbitt shaw uh they bought the house in the 1940s from the noltons and shaw was the guy that got the, the charlotte coliseum built and ovens auditorium well see then this house begins to take, and one of the things he really wanted was a zoo. He wanted a zoo for Charlotte. I he remember he liked elephants. elephants. Yeah, he liked elephants, and they brought an elephant and gave him an elephant. So I, there's a picture. Now that I, also their daughter was uh, a um, an artist, 
and she was the one that did the human manta waste thing. Oh, okay. That's so, interesting. so you know, it all starts. It, it's more than just it's more than just a house. It becomes, if you will, uh, you know, it it becomes it becomes an artifact. It becomes something of significance. But, and I'm gonna get back to it just a minute. Let me get myself. I got myself all fouled up there. The I think you closed it. His, yeah, I know. I'll get it back <laughs> real quick. quick. It, it's 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 no problem. No problem. We're gonna get right back. Everybody's going to be very patient with me. I want to show you what we were able to do with this Shaw house, which I think has real, um, it really does, sure, and I, can, I can do something since it's on the computer. See that? Right. Oh, zoom in. All right. All right, look, they own three acres of land. It's zoned single family. That's R3. That means that they could put nine houses on it. The man who was, the, this this house, the Shaw house was scheduled to be torn down. That meant the Shaw, the mayor, his daughter who did the McManaway statue, the woman who saved the library, all that's going to go poof in the wind, right? Whack, not going to be able to tell those stories, not going to be able to weave that story. He was going to tear it down because by zoning, he could put nine particular structures on there. And you know what would happen? He would tear down the house. The existing house would be demolished. Just whack it down. And what you do is put a cul-de-sac in it. Mm -hmm. And knock this down. You go right up here, whoop, put new houses in. I'm sure they all look historic. They're as, you know, as phony as a $4 bill, but anyway, <laughs> put it in there. And that was going to happen. Now, listen to me, Dana. He got a certificate of appropriateness from the Historic Landmarks Commission to tear this house down, to tear the Knowlton Shaw house down. And he, you know, all he had to do is wait a year. I went to see him as Preserve Mecklenburg in June of 2019, and I said, look, would you give us an exclusive assignable option to purchase the property? He said it's $1.85 million. In other words, that's what it would cost to buy it, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, there are some people who would say, well, you should never let any infill occur. No! infield no, 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 no. nobody was going to pay 1.85 million dollars for a 1928 house on three acres of land in uh, club acres they weren't going to do it so we didn't argue about that I said okay now did we have one million eight hundred fifty thousand dollars you bet your little bippy preserved mecklenburg didn't have 1.85 <laughs> million dollars we didn't even we didn't even have an ounce to, but he gave us, didn't give us, we paid $1 for the option. Now, it was our job to go and find somebody that we could assign our option to purchase to. And we found somebody. They have bought it, Mary Diana. They paid $1.85 million for it. They have gotten it rezoned. The city council supported it because we put together a plan that was a lot more sensitive than a cul-de-sac. Mm -hmm. Because if you'll notice, the whole view of the house is preserved. Now, and they're duplexes, but they're, these are two, no, one and two. You see, one, I mean, one and 10. You see one and 10? Yeah. One and 10 are going to be single family residences. Mm -hmm. The others are going to be duplexes. But they'll look like single family houses. They're just barely attached over here in the garage. Mm -hmm. so, now, this has been approved. The zoning's been reapproved. And I'm telling you, within a month, construction will begin. And this is going to okay. be a huge, huge project. Now, going back to the, the, the UDO, mm -hmm. okay, the UDO says, 
you can have more units of housing on a particular parcel of land. Going back to when I showed you the front lawn of the Edward Carville Griffith House, mm -hmm. we, of course, might well find that Preserve Mecklenburg is going to be a very important force in trying to influence that when greater development does occur on these large estates that it's done in the most sensitive manner possible so that you get that kind of result. Now, Mary Dana, I'm going to make you take me over there when this is uh, being built because it will be a scene to see. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'll be and happy. I'm sure we'll get some criticism. Some people will say, oh, no, no, you should not have allowed that. Now, I think I'm probably at about 30 minutes. Do you think I'm probably at about 30 yes. minutes? Yes. Yes. Well, I'm going to try to do another one. But if I don't get to it, then that that's that's okay because and, and it's very much very much involved with exactly the same type of thing that we've talked about before. You remember, I think, that we had a whole podcast on Frank Ramsey McNinch. Yes. Remember he was he was that big prohibitionist. Yes, and, and he, he was, was mayor during was, the you know, he was pandemic. A, he was, and... Yeah, pandemic, uh, the, the influence of pandemic. Mm. Mary Dana, this house was built in 1925. It's on Sharon Lane, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, we are very close to this being done. We did exactly the same thing here. The owner worked cooperatively with us and he was not under any obligation to do so he didn't have he simply wanted he felt that the time had come that he needed to sell the property again he owned over three acres of land but he wanted to do it in a way that would be the most sensitive to the preservation of the house and if you notice there is somewhat of a similarity between how this house looks and how Edward Carville Griffith's house looks. White house, far from the street with a big front lawn. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, the price for this particular property was considerably higher than the price for the property because it's on Sharon Lane. Sharon Lane is a very, very, um, uh, Fine Street, and I'm not going to, you know, there's Frank Ramsey McNinch, mm -hmm. and you know, he was big in Second Presbyterian Church, which used to be uh, North North Trine Street, and you know, there, there he is, you know, there's that, there's that prohibition stuff, help me to keep him pure, please vote against the sale of liquors, you know, Frank McNinch was so big into that. He was obviously a major, major figure. And had, we showed this before. This is a photograph of the house as it was in 1925. And of course, here's Sharon Lane. And you can see that it's it's a very different place than it is today. There's been, of course, all Foxcroft's all back here and all kinds of developments. But again, the time had come when we had to think about could we do something that would be sensitive, that would be uh, acceptable in terms of, now if I go off, I'll go back on, hey, I'm so lucky. <laughs> all right, let's go back. Now I wanna show you what we're doing. Now this is almost a done deal. It's almost a done deal. It, 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 it'll be a done deal, I think in a month. But now here, here is uh, the McNinch house. And you'll notice that the, the developers say a little bit about the house designed under the village and eye of Preserve Mecklenburg. Now listen, I've asked people to support Preserve Mecklenburg. We mm -hmm. had some response, but I tell you, there are a lot more people that watch these podcasts that have supported Preserve Mecklenburg. But anyway, that's it. Now here it is. Oh. Here, here's the point. Now, this is Sharon Lane down here, down at the bottom, okay? Down at the mm -hmm. bottom. 
The city is making, now these, this is really a stupid thing, man. They, they have these things called tag lots. Yeah. You can create, see, see this lot right here, the McNinch house? Yes. It actually comes down and hits the cold sack. See oh. this lot here for this car? It comes down and tags it here. Oh, see I all see. these little lines. Go, yeah. It's called tag lots, which allows you to get more. You, now, these are all single, these are all single family residences. Mm hmm. Now, the same thing is true here as with the McNinch house, uh, with the Shaw house. Not only is the original house being saved, but they're accepting a preservation easement that assures its preservation in perpetuity and preserve Mecklenburg will be able to prevent demolition for here and hereafter. And I can tell you right now, that Preserve Mecklenburg played a very, very important part. No more important than the owner who was very cooperative. No more important than the people who are buying it. But it's going to be, and you drive by this property all the time. I do. That's well, true. you're going to see some interesting things starting to happen. Yeah. So I'll just say sort of in conclusion, there are big changes coming because of this unified development ordinance. This unified development ordinance is going to make it much more likely that we're going to see more and more infill development on these large estates in these older neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And I would simply say that Preserve Mecklenburg could play a very important role in making sure that that is implemented in a sensitive way and let me say to each of y'all who are watching this podcast, you know, if you are thinking about selling your property and you care about what's going to happen to the character of the lot after you leave it, call us, contact us, get in touch with Preserve Mecklenburg. How, how do people do that? What's well, the best you know, way? it's on the website. It's on the website, and Lord God, I can't, I can't do everything. <laughs> but uh, I can't do everything. Where do uh, they go? PreserveMac.org. Well, wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, let's see if we can find something. <laughs> you trying to find the no, contact I can't do it. I can't. I can't do it. I can't do it. <laughs> I, I got it somewhere, but I can't do it. PreserveMech.org, P-R-E-S-E-R-V-E-R-E.org, -E 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 forward slash uh, donate. And, well, that's and, how they donate, yeah. but but also people, if they're selling their house, who should they? The same thing. Oh, they should contact, email me, danmarl2 at gmail.com. That's right. So you can and always Marl email my dad. D-A-N-M-O-R-R-I-L-L-2 -L -L at gmail.com. The number the two. The big thing is the you'll get two. your price. You'll get your price. We're not asking you to give it away. You tell us what you want for it. We will work to find a buyer who will come in there and do something other than obliterate your house. And we'll do it in a most sens uh, sensitive way that will basically really retain the character of your neighborhood. So just think about that. And um, Mary Diana, I guess that's about it. Uh, okay. How'd you, how'd you, did you enjoy that? Yes, I'm glad to know what's going on with the Shaw House. And well, the I've Nintendo got more stuff exciting. going on that I need. I'll probably, next week, I think I'm going to probably do more of this type of thing. Okay. And I, particularly, I particularly want to talk about the Elizabeth Lawrence Garden. Oh, yeah, that is a big deal going on. Well, it With Winghaven, be, right? Very, or, or... Big, it's a fascinating preservation issue, but um, and I don't know whether Preserve Mecklenburg will be, be involved or not, but it's a very, very interesting issue. Okay, well, that sounds great. Okay, well, everybody, thanks for uh, being back with us after our time off. And we will look forward to seeing you next week. Bye, everybody. I hope you liked it. Bye.